this time, we will move on to Brother Clint Goodman. Brother Goodman, his wife Erica, and their four children, Levi, Cole, and the twins, Macy and Jax, live in Bridgeport, Texas, and there attend the Carpenter Street Church. Brother Goodman has been in the full-time evangelistic work for the past five years. He will present to us his thoughts on atheism and the terrible impact it has on so many in our world. Satan, appreciate you. The opportunity to have a study with you on the subject of atheism. As we begin, we define the atheistic point of view and let them speak for themselves when one writer said that an atheist is not primarily a person who believes that a God does not exist, rather he does not believe in the existence of a God. When we think about the position of atheism, uh, we might look at these two distinctions or definitions and say, what's the difference? I know I, I've read that several times and, and was a little confused by that, but basically the point is we might say that they're not affirming anything, that they're not taking an affirmative position and saying God does not exist, but rather they're not affirming that, that uh, God does exist. And so whatever type of atheism uh, we might see, whether it be implicit, which is to say that one uh, doesn't consciously reject the notion of a God, or whether it be explicit that they indeed reject that notion, whether it's agnosticism or claiming that it's impossible to know, uh, or whatever the variety of atheism uh, there are several things and approaches that we could take to study in the subject or the system of beliefs. Several questions that you might read or encounter in this, the subject matter of atheism. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in the world? Or why doesn't God just reveal himself? All different kinds of questions or things that we could bring up along that nature. And we could spend a great deal of time talking about those things this afternoon, but rather if we will uh, consider these questions don't have to do with the real issue, and it's about the evidence, and what does the evidence say about the existence of God? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. Without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And so we see a very logical sequence. First is that God exists, and then second, it's about the nature or the character of that God. And these questions that we often encounter and that you'll often see in maybe writings of different atheistic authors about evil and the problems of evil, or why doesn't God just reveal Himself, there are, those are questions about the character of God and what, what kind of character He has. So uh, we see that the Bible agrees that it's about the evidence. First, we've got to come to the conclusion that He exists, that He is there. And then we can go on to examine what kind of God that He is or His character and nature. We find that the atheist agrees with this also. George H. Smith, in his book, Atheism, The Case Against God, made this statement. He said, Atheism is not the absence of belief in gods plus certain positive beliefs. Atheism is the absence of belief in God. If we can show theism to be unsupported, false, or nonsensical, then we have simultaneously established the validity of atheism. This is why the case for atheism is the case against God. And so when we get these definitions of atheism, when we consider these ideas, we might wonder why it's included in a topic or a study of world religions. But what we find is that atheism is indeed a system of beliefs. There's two centers of faith for atheism. I have self and science listed up there on the slide. And when you think about the centers of faith for atheism, any way you slice it, it's a belief system. It's a worldview. It's a it's a faith that people base their lives on and how they're going to live and the decisions that they're going to make and what they'll do and not do. Probably the most common, that's an assumption on my part, the most common center is that one we have, uh, it will be on your left-hand side of self. But rather the most professed would be the other, that's science, that that, that uh, basis for beliefs is in science and scientific discovery and all that science has revealed and, and shown that. Uh, various religions, whatever they might be, are not needed or false or mythology, basically. And so, as we examine this system of beliefs, we're going to take a look at that evidence. We're going to focus on what really is the issue. What does the evidence say about the existence of God? 
And we do that, we'll consider the way that the, uh, those who claim science as a basis for their belief or lack of belief in God uh, go back to the basis of their method, the scientific method. As you can see that kind of flow chart there, you've got in the top box a process of observation, hypothesis, and experiment that's ever repeating itself. Uh, observations might be something, the sky is blue, or something uh, that's quantitative, such as water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, whatever uh, the observation might be, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, it's just the simple observation, what is observed. And after that observation takes place, then a hypothesis is formulated, and that hypothesis is a possible explanation of what has been observed. And then you see the experiment down there at the bottom, and the point of the experimentation is to test the validity of whether the hypothesis is supported by the evidence that's gathered. If that hypothesis flows and goes in line with, with the things that have been observed, not only previously, but during that experiment. And we see that it's a continuing process, and that out of that come two things. On one, you have the law, and then on the other, you have the theory. That's followed by prediction, experiment, and then that's modified as needed as an ever-continuing process um, of scientific method. Now, we want to distinguish the difference between the theories and the law, and we're, we're given that uh, in a another science textbook and a chemistry textbook this quote was taken it says note the difference between a natural law and a theory a natural law is a summary of observed measurable behavior whereas a theory is an explanation of behavior a law summarizes what happens a theory or a model is an attempt to explain why it happens so we see the distinction that's made the law that's what happens that's what's observed that's the evidence. That's what we see. Observed time and time again. Uh, and so that would be classified as natural law. This is what happens. Now the theory, the model, the hypothesis, the explanation is an attempt to explain why. And keep in mind that as we go through and we study uh, through this topic and some of the major arguments of atheism. We go to an example of this process of the scientific method. You know, the scientist makes observations. People become ill. They become sick. We'll use the flu in this instance. And so that science begins to study that. Is that something that can be overcome? Well, they determine that the flu is caused by a virus. And that further study reveals that the body fights viruses by producing antibodies to attack those viruses and to conquer that infection so that a person can go on and recover from that sickness. And so here's the theory. If we can weaken and isolate that virus, if we can inoculate a, a person to that virus, or we, a process we call immunization, then they will develop an antibody to the virus and thus not experience the full effects of the virus. And, and there we see a success of science. We see observation, scientific discovery that's been made over the year, a theory that flows along and makes very logical sense, uh, very... Uh, intuitive, we might say, of what we found or observed in science. Now, as we consider this scientific method, let's consider it in light of the three major arguments that have to do with the evidence. What does the evidence say about God and His existence? And we'll begin with the cosmological argument, which is an argument that the universe had a beginning. The teleological argument, that's about the design uh, the complexity, the precision of the universe, and then the moral argument about the existence of absolute values. So um, to begin with the cosmological argument, cosmos is a Greek word meaning world or universe. And so the argument runs like this, or the logic of that argument would be that, one, everything that had a beginning had a cause. The universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause. And so when we think about uh, the cosmological argument. What does the evidence say about the universe, about its existence? Well, let's look into that as far as what science has uh, observed. General relativity. Back in 1916, this was on the desk of a 
a man named Albert Einstein, as, as you're probably aware. He's formulating this theory. He's, he's got an idea in mind, and he sees this, this uh, system of equations, um, and he's come to an irritating point in theorizing about re general relativity because he realizes his conclusions are leading to the, uh, the end that the universe, that all time, all space, all matter had a definite beginning. And he doesn't like that because he wants the universe to be eternal, to be static. And so what he does is he plugs in a constant so that he doesn't end up where that he doesn't want to go with that theory of relativity. And that theory of relativity is later proven by other scientists to be accurate to five decimal places. We see that uh, in 1927 that this is observed by Hubble. And we read this quote here. It says, with his cosmological cosmological constant now completely crushed by the weight of the evidence against it, Einstein can no longer support his wish for an eternal universe. He subsequent, subsequently described the cosmological constant as the greatest blunder of my life. And he redirected his efforts to find the box top to the puzzle of life. Einstein said that he wanted to know how God created the world. I am not interested in this or that phenomenon, in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thought, the rest are details. And so we see where the evidence led Albert Einstein. Though it wasn't the conclusion that he wanted to arrive at, when he observed the evidence through the, uh, through the telescope, that his theory of relativity was true, that there was a definite beginning to all time, space, and matter, then he made that concession. He, he, led the, he followed the evidence to its logical conclusion. We talk about the law of causality. When we think about the beginning of the universe, the law of causality, um, we find that it's the first premise in the argument that we, uh, the logic of the cosmological argument that we referred to earlier, and it's that everything that had a beginning had a cause is the law of causality, which is the fundamental principle of science. Without the law of causality, science is impossible. In fact, Francis Bacon, the father of modern science, said, True knowledge is knowledge by causes. In other words, science is a search for causes. That's what scientists do. They try to discover what caused what. And that's the, the basis of this whole argument. Everything that had a beginning had a cause. That's logical. That's what's observed. We observe that through science. Of the, scientific method. the scientific process observes that everything that has a beginning has a cause. And... We see that scientists try to discover what caused what. If science is going to be successful in finding a cure for a said disease, they're going to have to first determine the cause of that. And what do they observe? They observe that they, there is causes. That when something happens, it happens because of a cause. <clears throat> and then also the second law of thermodynamics. Again, we see that this is a law. This is something that's observed. What does this mean? The second law of thermodynamics is stated in terms of entropy. It says the total entropy of the universe does not change when a reversible process occurs and increases when an irreversible process occurs. It can be shown that the behavior of the entropy of the universe constitutes a completely general statement of the second law of thermodynamics, which applies not only to heat flow, but, to, but also to all kinds of other processes. The second law of thermodynamics is a law of science. It's an observation that's been made by science that says that things are expanding, that they're increasing in randomness or disorder, or what the, this statement refers to as entropy. So that things are becoming uh, more disorganized over time um, as the universe broadens. And, and it's a principle of science that, that uh, this author says can be applied very broadly. It doesn't just apply to heat flow. And then there's many statements uh, that are made. We see a statement that's made that says that the law that entropy increases, the second law of thermodynamics, thermodynamics rather, holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, 
then so much for Maxwell's equations. But if it be found in contradiction by observation, well, these experiments do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse into deepest humiliation. And that's a, a quote uh, from Paul Davis in the Cosmic Blueprint. So we see that this law of science is, is very highly esteemed in the scientific community, that entropy increases. So what are the theories, the explanations, the attempts to say why these things happen? Time, matter, and space are presupposed in all major origin theories. Or simply stated, matter is eternal, something that we may have heard uh, a great deal um, from the atheistic standpoint. Maybe a position that's beginning to be more and more abandoned. But if you look into and examine origin theories that science authors, whether it's uh, the Big Bang, the uh, whatever uh, type theory that, that they present, it always has some ev element of matter. No matter how small, maybe it's microscopic and they begin forming together, but they also uh, have time and space all presupposed, which is... Uh, we see also that the explanation is that the universe is a result of an accident. And that over a massive amount of time, I've got in parentheses, billions of years, chaos and disorder have gradually become more and more organized. Those are the explanations we're given, the theories that we're given as to why or how we got here, uh, how the universe started, you might say. Reason or faith? The conflict between Christian theism and atheism is fundamentally a conflict between faith and reason. I will not accept the existence of God or any doctrine on faith because I reject faith as a valative cognitive procedure. And George H. Smith here says, I reject faith as a valative cognitive procedure. Do those conclusions, do those theories, does that sound like reason or the, the result of reason? Well, look at this chart. We've got general relativity, which has been proven true to five decimal places. We have the law of causality, that everything that has a beginning has a cause. We have the second law of thermodynamics. And then we have the explanations of the scientific community as to the beginning or the origin of the universe, that matter is eternal, that the universe is a result of a giant accident, and that over billions and billions of years, the the universe is becoming more and more organized, more and more complex, that via evolution that we're reaching a new pinnacle and, and, and things are just becoming more and more uh, fine-tuned and organized. And what we see as we consider the position of atheism is that it's a position that stands in direct opposition to the evidence, the things that science observes. Is that reason or faith? And I will submit to you that it's a position of unreasonable faith and a much reasonable position is God is. A position that looks at the evidence and follows it to its conclusion that the universe indeed had a definite beginning. All time, space, and matter were there. The law of causality. The cause was God. God said. And that the universe is degenerating and, and all that consistent. Teleological argument. The second argument uh, in our uh, basis, this is the uh, idea of the complexity, precision, the design. And the word telos means design. And so the logic of this argument, much like the first one, every design had a designer. The universe has a highly complex design, therefore the universe had a designer. When we think about the teleological argument, the first principle or law or observation of science is this anthropic principle. And that's the title for the growing evidence that the universe is extremely fine-tuned or designed to support human life here on this earth. When we think about the existence that we have here, the design that's necessary, there's so many elements, so many factors uh, that go into making that possible, what, what are called anthropic constants. Things that have to be the way that they are, we would not be able to exist. And we've got a chart here, lists several of those things. Uh, we've got five of them there. The first one is oxygen level. If the oxygen level were any higher than it currently is, uncontrollable fires would erupt. We 
see on the news of the forest fires and, and the disasters that happen and the destruction that happens by fire. And those things would be rampant and out of control, making life here on this earth uh, impossible. If it were any lower, we would suffocate. We wouldn't be able to survive on a lower level of oxygen. The atmospheric transparency is the abbreviation there. If it were any higher than it is, uh, uh, there wouldn't be enough light. If the transparency was any lower, I believe those are backwards, we would burn up. And so that's the idea, though. If the, if the transparency of the atmosphere was any lower, there wouldn't be enough light coming in. If it was any higher, we would burn up. The moon to earth, gravitational forces... Um, if they were higher than they were, there would be severe tidal effects. If they were lower, the climate would be unstable. It would just be impossible to live. Carbon dioxide, if it were any higher, there would be a runaway greenhouse effect. And again, we burn up. If it were any lower, then plants wouldn't be able to photosynthesize, and that would throw the oxygen level out. And you can see how these things depend upon each other. The level of gravity... You can see that. That begins with the decimal places and over 30 zeros before that one. If the level of gravity, the force of gravity, were varied by that much, then life would be impossible. And to say that the universe wasn't designed, that it's a result of an accident, what does the evidence say about design? The law of biogenesis, what does uh, science tell us? about the beginning of life. We see this quote. It says, In the field of biology, one of the most commonly accepted and widely used laws of science is the law of biogenesis. This law was set forth many years ago to dictate what both theory and experimental evidence showed to be true among living organisms, that life comes only from preceding life and per perpetuates itself by reproducing only its own kind or type. Life comes from life. That's what science observes. Consider another quote. It says, students are given in great detail the historical scenario of how Pasteur triumphed over mythology and provided science its finest hour as he discredited the then popular concept of spontaneous generation. And then with almost the next breath, students are informed by their professor of how evolution started via spontaneous generations. The observation of science is that life never comes from non-life. Spontaneous generation has never been observed to occur. Macroevolution versus microevolution, or however you want to look at that. The observations. Evolution is a word that means change. And so when we consider the idea of evolution, yes, it's something that's observed in science, but something that's never been observed in science is macroevolution. Microevolution, small changes within these limits that have been observed by science that we have up here. Genetic limits, that there's uh, many genetic limits to evolution. Uh, we think of the statement we read again and again in the book of Genesis, after its kind. And that's what we observe in nature that life for, brings forth life after its kind. We find that change is cyclical or it occurs in cycles. You take uh, finches, Darwin's uh, famous finches, and how he observed their beaks changed with the climate. And what we also observed, or what science also observed, is that that change was cyclical, that it went back and forth, that it fluctuated with the weather patterns, and that it, it was a cycle. What science has observed is that organisms, living organisms, are irreducibly complex. And if you think about the idea of evolution, and the, the illustration here would be your car and the way that your car runs. It's a very complex, ordered system. If one part of your car were to evolve, and the rest of it didn't evolve at the exactly the same time, that your car would be unfunctional. If the cylinder walls of the engine evolved to larger size, then the pistons wouldn't be able to produce the compression necessary. Or, and, and the idea is taken down to living organisms on a cellular level, that if you had evolutions like that, that organisms are irreducibly complex and leads to the next point, which is the non-viability of the transitional forms, that if that were to occur, that organism wouldn't be functional because 
They're irreducibly complex. And then the idea that science has observed molecular isolation, which has to do with DNA. Um, some scientists will interpret the common uh, factors of DNA in different living organisms to try to prove an ancestral relationship, while what we see uh, from molecular isolation is that there's only a certain makeup that can produce life in the current environment that we have here on this earth. And so what science has observed is that micro changes happen within these limits that we see over here. And then the fossil record. When we get to the fossil record, uh, we find a couple of quotes that we'll consider briefly. It says, 99% of biology of any organism resides in its soft anatomy, which is inaccessible in a fossil. And so when we think about the information that's gathered from a fossil, what we need to understand about science is that we're talking about 1% of the biology when we go to fossils, when what we can learn from fossils. And then another quote that we see is to take a line of fossils and claim that they represent a lineage is not scientific hypothesis that can be tested, but an assertion that carries the same validity as a bedtime story. Amusing, perhaps even instructive, but not scientific. And so when you go to the museum and you see the line of fossils, understand that. One, 99% of the biology resides in the soft tissue, which was inaccessible in the fossil. And the two, to take that line of fossils and claim that they represent a lineage is not scientific. It carries the same validity as a bedtime story. The explanations that science gives us, reductionism, that we can take everything to the most simple elements, everything can be broken down to that elemental uh, periodic chart stuff that you learned in chemistry class, that it's, it's reducible and, and we can take it down to that level, that life arose from non-life via spontaneous generations, evolution, uh, macroevolution, evolution on a broad scale. Consider these theories that are being taught to your children in school that you probably learned going through school and that will continue to be taught until they're replaced by a better scientific theory in light of the things that we've studied on this teleological argument. Is that science or philosophy? Consider the following quote. One writer said, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of its patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material cause, causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Is that science? Is that scientific? No, he concedes exactly what it is. They had their mind made up before they ever even looked at the evidence. That's not the scientific method. When we think about the teleological argument or the design argument, the complexity, the precision that we see, that we observe in the universe, we see that the anthropic principle or the constants that we see is in opposition to the theories, the explanations of why. The law of biogenesis, that life arose from non-life the fossil record and macroevolution. We see the evidence goes in a different direction than the theories and the explanations that we're given of why, the things that we're told of why, and, and the attempts that are given to try to explain our origins. A scientific approach, an examination of the evidence, a logical conclusion, God is. Organisms are irreducibly complex. The law of biogenesis, life, arises from life, the same kind. And the information contained in the fossil records, a very much more, much more scientific conclusion we see is that position of faith in God. We go on to the moral argument. And this may not be so 
so much scientific, but we see we can follow that same uh, process of observation, the things that we observe uh, every day around the environment and the world around us, um, the existence of absolute values. We consider the logic of the moral argument, and it's the same as the other two arguments that we've considered. Every law has a lawgiver. A moral law does exist. There is a moral law. Therefore, there is a moral lawgiver. Now, when we think about this, uh, the observations, what we observe about morality and the idea of a moral law is that it's undeniable. When we think about the moral law being undeniable, we see that it's proven by reaction. It's proven by observation. We take the idea of personhood, that man is different than animals. When we consider the idea of personhood, that an individual has rights, they have intellect, they have free will, they have ethical responsibility and moral accountability. They've got inalienable rights. And if anybody were to stand up and to disagree with that and to say that's not true, notice in the other column what they would be doing. They would be engaging in thought. They'd be exercising their freedom to do so. They would feel responsible to get up and to contend for the truth or to hold that other individual morally accountable for teaching that which is true. And they'd be exercising their right to disagree. You see, these are some of the foundational ideas for morality and their being right and wrong. And to deny those is to defeat yourself. It's to deny rationality. It's to deny logic. It's to deny reason. And so that's why we've concluded that it's undeniable, it's self-evident, we might say, it's proven by reactions that good and evil do, in fact, exist. Notice this quote. It says, in the end, atheism cannot justify why anything is morally right or wrong. It cannot guarantee human rights or ultimate justice in the universe. To be an atheist, atheist, a consistent atheist, you have to believe that there is nothing really wrong with murder, rape, genocide, torture, or any other heinous act. By faith, you have to believe that there is no moral difference between a murderer and a missionary, a teacher and a terrorist, or Mother Teresa and Hitler. Or by faith, you have to believe that real moral principles arose from nothing. Since such beliefs are clearly unreasonable, we do not have enough faith to be atheist. You consider the quote, the amount of faith that it takes to be an atheist. And that's what you have to believe. That there's no morality. That good and evil don't really exist. You do whatever makes you happy. And the books that I read time and time again, author after author, this is what I noticed. Morality is about doing what, an individual, what makes an individual happy. That's what life's all about. You pursue your desires and do what makes you happy. Everything's subjected. That may be good for you and true for you, but that's not good for me and true for me. And that there's no absolutes. But what do we observe? What do we see all around us? What does the evidence say about morality? That it's undeniable? That it's proven by how we act to injustice and immorality? That good exists and evil exists? That truth exists and lies exist? And the observations given with the atheistic theories or explanations about life and morality, they don't follow. They don't flow together. In fact, they're contrary one to another. Facts or fiction. When we think about what we see here, to borrow a word from George H. Smith, the atheistic author that we've quoted earlier, it's nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. You look at the facts, you look at the evidence, you make observations, a very much more logical, a much more sensible conclusion is God is. And the lawgiver is God. The moral law exists because he instituted it, that he put it into place. When we consider the debate between theism and atheism, let's talk about what the issues aren't. It's not about crazy religious fundamentalists versus the objective scientist. You see, and that's how that the society, that the atheistic community wants to pitch you. That you're this crazy religious fundamentalist and here, over here is the objective scientist. That's not what it's about. It's not about creation versus evolution. It's not about religion versus science or the Bible versus science or faith versus reason. What the issues are, what the, issue, the real issues are about is about good science versus bad science. It's about reason 
reasonable faith versus unreasonable faith. It's about the evidence. And what does the evidence say? What does the evidence tell us? The results. We've got the column up here of good science on one side, of bad science on the other side. And the results, the progression that takes place from good science. Good science starts off with an unbiased examination of the evidence. That unbiased examination will lead, as we've seen through our study today, to intelligent design, to creation. It'll lead one to the Bible, which will lead one to faith in God, which will lead one to draw near to God, which will end in the saving of their soul. Versus the approach of bad science to start off with the, your mind already made up, or as we read earlier in A prior, our commitment to materialism. It'll lead you to accept faith by faith by faith, spontaneous generation as an explanation for life on this earth. By faith, macroevolution. By faith, ever-changing textbooks of science. It'll lead to faith in yourself and in science and a refusal to retain God in your knowledge. And it'll lead to the loss of souls, many souls. This quote says, In grammar school, they taught me that a frog turning into a prince was a fairy tale. In the university, they taught me that a frog turning into a prince was a fact. And we laugh, but that's exactly what they teach us. That's exactly what I was taught. That's exactly what your children will be taught until a better theory, until a better explanation is plugged in. But you can be assured that the theory or the explanation won't have God in it. And so understand the seriousness of the material. They would like us to believe that everybody that's educated, that all scientists believe this way, that they reject God as a possible explanation, and that's very far from the truth. James Tower, a, a nanoscientist, said only a rookie who knows nothing about science would say science takes away from faith. If you really study science, it'll bring you closer to God. You know, because science, true science, good science, is based on the evidence. It looks at the evidence, and it follows it to its logical conclusion. You know, in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, the scripture says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What does God say about the evidence? That there's more than enough. That you're without excuse. That when you look at the evidence and you don't go to the right conclusion, there's nobody to blame but yourself. Going back to that center of faith, because God said that the evidence is more than sufficient. Just as atheism is the opposite of theism, their faith is also the opposite. Biblical faith follows the evidence supplied by God to its logical conclusion, while atheistic faith leaps in the opposite direction of the evidence to an irrational and illogical conclusion. That's what we see, that the faith of atheism, though they claim science, is very unscientific. That's why Paul told Timothy to avoid oppositions of science, falsely so-called, because that's what it is to claim science as a basis for atheism. It's to mislabel it, what science actually is. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, it starts there with believing that God is. And then it goes on from there, believing about what kind of God that he is. And so we see that the position of theism, of belief in God, the belief that we have, is a belief that follows the evidence to a logical conclusion, that which has been supplied by God. There's no need to be ashamed of that or to feel intimidated when you go off to get an education by those who profess science as a, a basis for atheism because they're in a position that doesn't follow the evidence. They're not intellectually superior. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse number 15, Paul told Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And so as you go out into the world, as you come into contact with an atheist, I'll reiterate the statement that's been said by my brethren before me that there are souls on the line. And there's many souls on the line. 
And we need to handle ourselves in a way that glorifies and honors God. But we need to understand that we have a position that we can stand up with the same boldness that the atheist stands up with to defend their position, even more because we have a position that's based on the evidence that's supplied by God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I thank you for your time today.